Hi, I'm Nick Maselli. At TD Bank, we believe all citizens need to be informed about the important financial issues that affect their daily lives. That's why we're proud to support programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. This special edition of One on One with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Tisch WNET studios at Lincoln Center. Funding has been provided by Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, Berkeley College, TD Bank, Rowan University, educating New Jersey leaders, partnering with New Jersey businesses, transforming New Jersey's future, New Jersey Resources, Fedway Associates, and by Gary's Wine and Marketplace, creating an individual shopping experience for every guest. Promotional support provided by NJ.com. Small news, big news, true Jersey. And by the New Jersey Chamber of Commerce, the statewide voice of business in New Jersey. This is One on One. I'm an equal American just like you are. The jobs of tomorrow are not the jobs of yesterday. Look at this. You, you got it this? Back. Here it is, man. Look at that. Life without dance is boring. <laughs> when you first heard that they were doing Charlie Rose and Gail King, didn't you go, what? Do you enjoy talking politics? No. People call me because they feel nobody's paying attention. Our culture, I don't think, has ever been tested the way it's being tested right now. That's a good question. High five. We're joined by Rick Edelman, who is executive chairman of a Edelman Financial Services, best-selling author of Rescue Your Money. Good to see you. Great to be with you. By the way, I need to fully disclose that right before we got on the air, I was haranguing Rick about my own personal situation and asking for advice. A lot of people, how often? All the time. What do they say? Help me? <laughs> yeah, people want to know, am I doing the right thing? What should I be doing? I got a guy, here's what he said. And you know, I've been named by Barron's three times as the number one independent advisor in the nation. So people tend to come to me and say, you know, what do you, Rick, what should I do? And what do you think? And so on. What's Happens all the time. Like? Uh, it's gratifying on one hand. I mean, you don't ask advice of someone you don't have confidence in. So it's, uh, it's an honor and humbling. Uh, but on the other hand, I want to make sure people realize <laughs> that uh, I can't give them an answer in 30 seconds as much as I want to and they want me to. So, you know, it's sort of like accosting the doctor at a cocktail party and say, Doc, they go look at this thing. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'm I like, make an appointment with me because my two hour answer is a lot better than my 30 second answer. It. And my three week answer is fabulous. I love it. That's smart. Good marketing. And it's also true. Question. In this book, which I told you I found fascinating, this read, Rescue Your Money, How to Invest Your Money During These tumultuous times, three of the most important lessons, because I found about 20 in here, three most important lessons we need to know, Rick. Well, number one is to diversify. Don't mix, and this is important today, with the election environment and the new president and a new administration, don't mix politics and money. Everybody's focusing on what does Donald Trump mean and the Republican Congress mean for my portfolio. If you're planning for retirement, it means absolutely nothing. Because by the time you reach retirement, we're going to have another president, maybe another two or three or four presidents from now. So presidents have remarkably little impact on long-term effect of investment results. So diversify not with this president in mind, whether you like this president or not. Don't invest with this president in mind. Invest with your goals in mind. That's number one. Diversify on a long-term and global basis because we don't want to make big bets. We don't want to make a bet that could cost us our ability to achieve our goals. Define diversification. M owning uh, everything all the time. In other words, you want to own, there are 16 major asset classes in market sectors. Everybody thinks it's stocks and bonds. Wrong. There's sure there are stocks, but there's large cap, mid cap, and small cap. There's U.S. and international. There's growth and value. In the world of bonds, there's government, corporate, there's foreign and domestic. There's high quality and high yield. There's short term, intermediate, and long term. The list goes on. Then there's real estate, and there's commodities, oil and gas, precious metals, natural resources. The list goes on and on and on. So when I say diversify, I mean bet on every horse in the race and then own the racetrack besides. And that way, you don't care what the results are. You'll do just fine. Second rule long term. Make sure you're focusing on your goals. If your kid's going to college in 10 years or you're retiring in 20 or you've got a life expectancy of 40 or you're dealing with aging parents, focus on your long-term goals. Don't let the noise thrown at us by the mass media on a daily basis interfere with your long-term objectives. That's the difference between what I call surfers and sailors. Surfers can get wiped out by a big wave, but sailors know that the biggest waves do not affect the tides. 
Tsunamis and tidal waves will not interfere with a sailor crossing the ocean. And that's the whole point. If you're trying to play the market and gamble with your future and get in while it's hot and get out when it's not, you're going to blow it because nobody knows how to do that. Instead, stay invested for decades because I can pretty much agree, guarantee that you'll agree with this sentence. In 20 years, the stock market will be higher than it is today. But here's the thing. You say over these X number of years, mm -hmm. if you're in your 50s, your 60s, yeah. you don't have the same... Of course you do. As someone who's in their... 30s. Of course you do, Go because ahead. if you're in your 50s, you have a life expectancy of 40 years. And guess what happens by the time you are 90 years old? Life expectancy by then will be 100, 105. So you have decades to go, even if you're in your 60s and 70s. So therefore, I guess your third one in a second, but the retirement issue, do we need to re-examine the retirement issue? Yes. Because what we think we need isn't as much... We need more than what we think we need because we need, we're going to live longer. Our future isn't what we thought it was going to be. Yogi Berra was right. The future ain't what it used to be. That's the focus, actually, of my next book that's coming out March 7, uh, in 2017, focusing on longevity and how technology is radically altering everything. So you're absolutely right. We need to rethink our assumptions because the financial plan you've been building, the assumptions you've been making over how much should I have in stocks versus bonds and how conservative do I need to be, you're probably wrong about a lot of those assumptions. And that's what my book, Rescue Your Money, talks a lot about. Uh, we have some friends down at Rowan University. Ah. What's your deal with them? Uh, graduated from Rowan University. Uh, that's where I met my wife, Jean. We both graduated from there. And uh, we've been uh, huge fans of most of what I know, most of uh, what we learned how to do, we learned at Rowan. So we're really very big fans of Rowan University. There's something called a fossil park down there, is that what it is? Yes, Rowan University uh, acquired a fossil park. What a lot of folks don't realize uh, is that dinosaurs is relatively new science, the first dinosaur discovered in the 1840s in Haddonfield, New Jersey. Uh, most people don't realize that it's South Jersey is the hotbed of paleontology on this planet. And in Mantua Township, in the farm country of <laughs> South Jersey, they have a fossil park. There was a quarry built where they were mining minerals for industrial use, and they suddenly discovered fossils there. The quarry went out of business, so Rowan University bought the quarry, but didn't know what to do with it. So Gene and I gave Rowan University some money so that we can build a museum and visitor center and make it a place where kids, and actually kids of all ages, can actually not just watch science, but mm. you can jump into the quarry up to your elbows in the muck and pull out your own fossils. How much fun is that? It's fascinating. You and your wife are very committed to philanthropy, but the other thing I'm fascinated by is, uh, in the minute or so we have, I have two minutes, when did you know that you were fascinated by money and the management of money? I never was, and I'm still not. Graduated college without ever taking a business class. Was never brainwashed by them. I'm not interested in money. I'm interested in people. I'm interested in the human dynamic, and I'm interested in what makes us so human and the relationships we have with our parents and with our siblings and with our children, and understanding the aspirations and goals and fears that we have. Money is not about business and Wall Street and corporate. Money is all about the, the family and the humanity, and we're very much interested in what money can do for you and how you can make it work for you and for the society around you and the community at large. That, to me, is what makes it work. When did you, when'd you get this smart? Uh, I'm, I'm still working uh, <laughs> on that part. It, it's, it, it, listening to you talk about money that way, I wish some of the financial channels in the media and the financial platforms in the media could talk about money in that way. Rick Edelman is the author of Rescue Your Money, How to Invest Your Money During These Tumultuous Times, when he's a lot more than that. By the way, <clears throat> number one bestseller. Appreciate it. And by the way, what's the name of the book coming up in 17? It's The Truth About Your Future. Well done. Stay with us. We'll be right back right after this. To watch more one on one with Steve Adubato, find us online and follow us on social media. Stephen Jones is Chief Academic Officer for RWJ Barnabas Health. Good to see you, my friend. Good to be with you again, Steve. I also should uh, say full disclosure we are both Rutgers fans. Absolutely. You are hardcore, though. <laughs> uh, uh, Big Ten, that's, a good, that's the right thing? Big Ten is a great thing for uh, Rutgers athletics. And in you New predict Jersey. good things. I predict very good things. We will grow. Rutgers football, Rutgers women's basketball, Rutgers men's basketball. I'm a total Rutgers athletic geek. But you're here to talk about healthcare. I'm here to talk <laughs> about uh, healthcare and RWJ Barnabas Health, our commitment to academic medicine, particularly, Steve. Yeah, let's talk about that. Um, is there a physician shortage in the state of New Jersey and in the region? And if not, why do people keep saying that? Steve, we need more physicians, particularly primary care physicians. 
uh, New Jersey has great medical schools, and, uh, and RWJ Barnabas Health partners with, with uh, many great educational institutions, including Rutgers. And medicine in the future will work with teams, uh, advanced practice providers like nurse practitioners, physician assistants, pharmacists. We need more primary care physicians. We need to train more physicians. And we need to support that team because they will work in a team in the future. But, but here's the thing. I've also, we've had many offline conversations. I've also done leadership development over at RWJ Barnabas Health, particularly with physicians and talk to them about leadership and communication. And sure. one of the things that struck me um, is that there's a whole discussion about um, how we train physicians. Isn't there a whole discussion about the way physicians are trained for the future and that the healthcare landscape is changing such that physicians need to be trained differently? Or am sure. I making too much of that? No, no, absolutely. There, there are dramatic changes. One, we're not in the bed business any longer. What do we're you mean, promoting not in the wellness. Bed business? What does that mean? Steve, I've been a hospital administrator for 40 years. Early in my career, the idea was when people got sick, they went into a bed in a hospital. Today, we're really focused, we, the medical industry, hospitals, on keeping people well and promoting health. We want people to stay in their homes, stay on their job, stay in their diverse communities that we serve. And we want to support them in that way, not just when they get sick. So it's more outpatient care than inpatient care. It's more preventive medicine than the high tech. We've got it all. We've got the ICUs and we will continue to grow them. And we have a real big focus on how we keep people well, because that's the goal. That'll reduce the cost of healthcare. But, but Steve, how do I respectfully, how does that change how you train physicians? Sure, if you go back, Steve, I'm not a physician, as you know, I'm a, a hospital administrator. We've trained physicians mainly in acute care hospitals around intensive care beds. We need to do much more in ambulatory medicine, and that is beginning. And both medical schools at Rutgers have ambulatory care facilities, and they work with RWJ Barnabas Health in our numerous ambulatory care facilities. There are new methods now, you know, home care, uh, telemedicine that, that you've yeah, talked about. That means. Show. Telemedicine means, sure. explain to folks what that means. Telemedicine means one doesn't always have to go to the city and meet with a physician. Um, a, Consumers are going to demand in the future sitting on their iPad at the dining room table. Today, we use telemedicine among facilities from a remote hospital to a, a, a larger hospital. But we will be using telemedicine in the living room and the dining room and talking to families and talking to paramedics that might be there uh, and making diagnosis. Today, it's used very, very effectively in stroke care and in, in some types of cardiac care. And doesn't it, it's so interesting from a communications perspective, which you know, I mean, in the other part of my life, I do a lot of coaching and training around communication and, and, and interpersonal communication. So what I'm fascinated by is the changes that that requires in physician mm -hmm. communication to be able to communicate technologically in a way that they haven't been trained before. Right. That's key. That is absolutely a key. And newer physicians coming out, I mean, they grew up playing yes. Pac-Man or something like that. How about the vets? And, and so... Uh, and then the veteran physicians, yeah. more, more challenging? Yeah. And people say they are. We work with a lot of senior attendings who are very computer savvy and, and use smartphones and, and things like that. I, I, I mean, years ago, Steve, yeah. uh, we didn't know somebody had a heart attack till they got in the emergency room and they put on a 12 lead. Today we know before they leave their dining room or the bedroom on Sunday How? morning because the paramedics have them hooked to the 12 lead telemetry and we can start IVs right there. The paramedics are talking to physicians in the emergency department and they're rendering care right in the living room or the dining room mm -hmm. where somebody fell and then going to the hospital. That's and that changes the, that changes the, so excuse me for interrupting, Steve, that potentially changes the outcome. Oh, that improves the outcome dramatically. Because? There's literature. Because you start to care fast. You know, time is muscle. Again, I'm not a physician, but time is muscle. And, and, and whether it's saving the heart or saving the brain, it's important to, to do that quickly. And in the new modes of care and in academic medicine, we are teaching people how to, be, how to do that today. Yeah. And it'll keep more people healthy for the future. See, before I let you out here, I'm curious about something. Um, why do we so often, say in New Jersey in particular, we're taping here in New York City at the Tish WNET studio, but on the Jersey side so much, why is it that we 
right now lose so many physicians who are trained in the New Jersey area who wind up going other places, and what are we doing about it? Steve, we have large training programs in New Jersey, in RWJ, Barnabas Health. Uh, you're familiar with the Academic Medical Center in New Brunswick, Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital, and at the great teaching hospitals, St. Barnabas Medical Center in Newark Beth, Monmouth Medical Center, Jersey City. We train a very diverse portfolio of, of students. New Jersey is a large trainer of medical education. Some people go to other locations. Mm -hmm. It's important to us that we retain these trainees in New Jersey. And we have lots of opportunity. We think the size and scale of RWJ Barnabas Health gives us the opportunity to early on encourage physicians to stay in our communities. And we cover a broad swath of New Jersey, about 5 million population, our neighbors of ours. And so we think there's great opportunity to work with young physicians that are finishing their residencies and their fellowships and to get them to stay in to New Jersey. To incent them to stay, Steve? You incent, incent them? them? Well, one would offer employment. Remember back in the day, most physicians were worked in private practice and did right. not want to be employed. Today, there's a big change toward employment. So in RWJ Barnabas Health, we have those opportunities. We have opportunity to incent them. We have opportunity to, we have every lifestyle in New Jersey, every location, every community type that, that a young trainee could want to live in and grow a family in and invest in, a, in our diverse communities. We think there's great opportunity. Stephen K. Jones, Chief Academic Officer for RWJ Barnabas Health. Good to see you. Great to be with you, Steve. Thank you. We'll be right back right after this. To see more one-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD and follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. That is awesome. And we have him here, Robert Creighton, yes, who sir. is the uh, co-creator and star of Cagney uh, at the West Side Theater at 407 West 43rd Street. What's the matter? You're not in good shape? <laughs> <laughs> Eight times a week right there. So it's, uh, it's a lot of fun, but it is, it's gotten me in good shape, which has been fun. <laughs> this, uh, give us a story about this play and your connection to it. I, uh, we were just talking about, I moved here from Canada. Uh, many years ago to go to acting school. And early on, a teacher said to me, you remind me of Jimmy Cagney, kind of have his energy, you're built like him. And I know you like to tap dance on the side. It was a straight acting school, American right. Academy, Dramatic Arts. And I started watching his films. I, didn't, I was a Fred Astaire guy growing up, Fred Astaire, Gene Kelly guy. And I started watching Cagney films and I pretty instantly was like, felt a connection there. Uh, wow, I do kind of look like him a bit, but when you're studying as an actor, you're working on your craft all the time, and he was so ahead of his time, I thought, as an actor. Just never a false word out of his mouth. Uh, mag I was what do you mean just, by that, never a false word? You believe everything he says. Some, in those old movies, when they're stylized, sometimes, you know, it looked put on. Absolutely. Uh, but I, you always believed him, no matter what character or how broad it was or how tough he was or how fun, you know, quirky he was being. You always believed it. It was always rooted, which is what good acting is. You don't, you don't see the work, you know? It's just, he's that guy. And so I was totally drawn to him on film. He was magnetic. That's the word I was looking for, magnetic on film. And then I started reading about his life and who he was as a person and his humanitarian, how, you know, he just went through life sticking up for the little guy, believed in justice, didn't like bullies. Mm. And uh, I started, I had a little interaction when they were trying, his estate was trying to put a show together. This is one year out of acting school. That fizzled quickly. It was just, they wanted someone to imitate Cagney and tell biographical stories. Uh, but that lit the fire in me, and I said, I'm going to do a show about James Cagney someday. And uh, talked about it for years, and then finally put pen to paper around the year 2000, and then uh, wrote a one-man show, and then met Peter Cawley, uh, a very successful Canadian playwright who lives in L.A., and I was there doing a show, and he came to see it, and we got chatting. 
And I was so passionate about Cagney at the time. I'm writing a show about Cagney. He said, well, let's have lunch, as you do in LA, and have we'll lunch. talk about it. And he really was the one who first um, helped me realize you have to create a story that even if you're not a Cagney fan, people can come and engage in this man's story, this guy who was born on the Lower East Side, grew up on the Upper East Side, was a, you know scrappy, used his fists all growing up, right. um, but at, at his heart was an artist and uh, needed a job. That's how he got into vaudeville, Broadway, and then ultimately Hollywood. And it was never, he didn't want to be a star. He didn't want He didn't want life. to be a star? Not interested. It was a job to him when he started to support his family. He worked four jobs and then this one paid 35 bucks a week at Keith's mu Music Theater right up the street here, 81st and Broadway. In drag, by the way. His wow. first show was a holdover from the First here. World War. <clears throat> Eight guys called Every Sailor. Very funny show called, I assume it was funny. Uh, right. I mean, <laughs> so, you really studied this guy. Oh yeah, he's, it's in my, I've been. Is it your DNA? I, is it, it is. I, I feel, you know, it's funny. I feel this show, you know, I, I've been very lucky to do lots of Broadway and have roles that I've really enjoyed. But this is something where I feel like I was, it's part of many other things, but this is part of what I was put here to do, to you're tell the story. You're supposed to do this. Yeah, this was, I was the guy who was supposed to tell the story. So when that. you're on stage, when you're doing the play, other than the incredible physical mm -hmm. part of it, the dancing, you know, the performance, that part of it, which you have to be in great shape for, what's the rest of it for you in terms of getting ready and being where you need to be? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it is a role where, as I said to my castmates sometimes, because bigger musicals where you're not always, it's not quite as intense at times or whatever, you're, I'm off stage checking scores and then going back on stage. And this one I have to get on the, the train gets on the track and I have to go through the show like is that. Is it you? Because, is uh, the show you primarily? No, no, it, it's, it's about Cagney and sure, uh, Cagney's the central character, but there's only six in the cast. Jack Warner is the other major player and they have their big battles. Starts in a made up scene <clears throat> backstage when Cagney's getting <clears throat> this Lifetime Achievement Award and then flashes back from there. Right. He and Warner start arguing. But there's uh, four other people in the cast who have sort of home base characters. My brother, yeah. Bob Hope, my mother, my wife. And then they play, they all play a ton of characters. Everybody they play is, other characters. Everybody's a star in the show. No one hides. Right. They all get big solos, big dance numbers. Real quick, speaking of dance, uh, the music. Some yeah. cla the classic uh, Cagney. Cohan, so we have, we have uh, you know, Cagney won an Oscar for playing George M. Cohan in 1942. So you couldn't do a show about Cagney without um, Cohan music. So we have a big USO number that's a medley of, which you just saw give some of. Give my Broadway. Yeah, give my over there. Uh, grand and Old Flag. The grand Old Flag. And then, and then the rest of it, uh, and we finish with, oh, I don't want to yeah. tell you how, how okay. we finish. No, People no, come okay. see it. Okay. You're going to see right. it. So. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but, you, you put some of your own stuff in but there. But then uh, two-thirds of it is original. <clears throat> it's an original score. Yeah. But you? Originally, I wrote the whole score. And then when we started collaborating, when I started collaborating with people who really knew what they were doing, about a third of the score is now mine. And two-thirds is, a, is oh. a great composer named Christopher McGovern who uh, sort of took over the score and uh, helped arrange my songs and then... Um, wrote two third wonderful songs. So you know what's so interesting to me? So uh, I'm reading about some of the reaction and response to reviews. They're really positive and That's they're great. It's really amazing, just but, yes. so touching. Yeah, right, so I think to myself, um, so an overnight sensation <laughs> took how many years? 17, 16, 17 years? Peter Cawley and I started writing together in 2003. Wow. First reading in New York was 2007. Our premiere was 2009 in Florida. Spring of 2015, we were at the York Theater on the east side, mm. and we broke their box office record for our five-week run there, and that's when we got a commercial producer mm. who believed that this show would do well in New York, and now we've been running nine months, and we're on sale to the end of May. And... So overnight, huh? <laughs> so overnight. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm overnight. Yeah. I've been... So how about this? What would you say to folks right now, whether they're in theater, whether they're in business, whether they're in sports, what doesn't matter what they're in, but they're like, yeah, I got rejected. It didn't work out. I don't think it's going to work out. You say to them. I just had this conversation with someone the other day who was asking me about their, their kid who loves theater and wants to maybe go into this for a living. And I, and I said, if, they, if there's anything else they'd love to do that, that they're passionate about also, maybe go do that and do this on the side for fun. But if this is the only, the only people who are gonna make it in this business, in this town, I'll talk about my world, are people who this, I didn't leave myself any option for failure. Uh, in terms of wanting to do something else. Struggle, struggle, success, success, struggle, 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 success, success. 
and you just keep moving forward. And I didn't, it, like leaving the business for me has never been an option because uh, if you believe you have talent, then you just have to keep moving and your opportunities will come. No um, other options. If you doubt it or there's something else you love to do that's easy, you know, that isn't quite as, you know, ebb and flow as this business is, then I would suggest going to do it. You're not going to sell insurance? <clears throat> not tomorrow. <laughs> I, got, I got a show. I got, got two today to and one tomorrow. We, we have Thursday matinees now, one of two shows in town, so that's been fun, too. People are finding theater on Thursday in New York, which is That's amazing. awesome. Robert Creighton, mind if I plug again? No, please. Uh, Co-creator and star of Cagney, West Side Theater, 407 West 43rd Street over on 9th? 9th Avenue. Listen, congratulations Thanks. on nice being an overnight success. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, can't thank you enough. Nice talking to you. Appreciate it. Okay. And looking forward to coming over and seeing you. Yeah, I hope you do. You gotta get in shape, I'm telling you. I'm working on it. <laughs> I'm working on it. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. This special edition of One on One with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Tisch WNET studios at Lincoln Center. Funding has been provided by Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, Berkeley College, TD Bank, Rowan University, New Jersey Resources, Fedway Associates, and by Gary's Wine and Marketplace. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. At Gary's Wine and Marketplace, planning parties is our business. Our associates can work with you to plan the details. We offer an assortment of wine, beer, spirits, cheeses, party platters, accessories, and more. Four locations in New Jersey and at garyswine.com.